Hello. Um, we are going to start to talk about some more Shakespeare. So we've already talked about the Shakespearean sonnet, so some different um, poetry that Shakespeare wrote. And now in the new year, more specifically, we're going to be looking into one of his plays. So this play of Shakespeare is called The Taming of the Shrew. All right. So I'll give you a little background, first of all, about Shakespeare's plays. And this would be a good thing to write down some notes for, um, maybe even listen to twice. All right. So Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, he was an English playwright who lived from about 1564 to 1616. Um, and his writing career, it seems like his act of time writing, so that was plays and sonnets, it's about a 20-year period, so two decades. So it spanned a fair bit of time. So he was a playwright, a poet, and he also did some acting as well and had his own theater troupe. Um, at the time, um, Queen Elizabeth I was in power. So she, this isn't the one that just passed away recently. That was Queen Elizabeth II. Um, so this was England's first um, queen that had the role of the monarchy. So really, when she was born, what her father was really hoping for was um, a son. And um, he, this was Henry VIII. He had many, um, his first wife had a daughter. Um, then he decided that his marriage was no longer valid. And it seems that the reason behind that was because his current wife, the queen, wasn't having more children, specifically that son that he really wanted. So he went and married somebody else um, called Anne. And she had a daughter. Um, she had a few more miscarriages as well. And then he... Um, accused her of a bunch of pretty nasty things, like some incest, some witchcraft. He had her beheaded, but then he could marry another wife. He was really after this son um, because I guess he felt that he couldn't pass on his, um, his role of monarch to anybody but a son, like a daughter wouldn't do. Um, so he went through quite a few wives until he finally died and his last wife um was safe because he was getting more and more irrational and having, um, I think he had at least two of them killed. He had one of his wife's set aside. Like he said to her, you're like a sister to me. So you can be my sister instead of my wife. And then he got married again. It was all, I guess, chasing this son. Um, anyhow, so queen Elizabeth the first, she ended up, she did have a brother. The brother only got to reign for a short time. He was sick and he died. And so she ended up getting to rule instead. So after all, her father's desires that there just be a son, there was a woman and she was a good um, queen um, in her own right. Like she was, uh, she was powerful. She made decisions. She um, refused to get married, actually. And she said that actually she was just married to England. But really, if she took on a husband, then she would be giving her responsibility to that husband. So um, this play is written at a time when there is a strong female leader, which often wasn't the case. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop for the, for the story. And there's going to be a lot in it, um, themes of, you know, relationships and um, what should be the dynamic, what should be the relationship between male and female. Does the husband need to control his, his wife um, to make her into the ideal wife? Um, this is also a time when people were going from arranged marriages to marriages for love. So it's a very transitional period. So that's just some of the backdrop. All right, so Shakespeare, back to his plays in general, he wrote some different types of plays. Some of them were histories, historical. Some of them were comedies. Comedies, yes, you know, they would be a bit more funny because that's a comedy. There's a few other characteristics that the comedies would have. The plays that were comedies would end in marriage. Um, they would um, use regular everyday people. So it wouldn't be like, you know, a king or a queen or um, some great historical figure. It, it 
use regular people in the comedies. Okay. So there could be some slapstick humor definitely ends in marriage. Um, regular people are part of it. Okay. So this play is under the, co the category of a comedy. We will find that it is a bit problematic that it doesn't fit. So let's say perfectly into that category. Like at the end of the play, you might be left thinking, Oh, I'm not quite sure how I feel about this ending. So it is a comedy, but let's say a problematic comedy. Okay. Um, lastly, there's tragedies too. So this might be, if you think about Hamlet or Macbeth, or maybe most famously Romeo and Juliet, when people at the end die, um, tragedies end in death. There's no happy ending. It doesn't end, you know, everyone's married and now happily ever after it's not happily ever after it's it's death so if it's a tragedy it'll involve people potentially like a king or some people from maybe the nobility and it does however end in death so that's tragedy all right so we had history this one's not a history but that's the type of play that he could write or did write we have comedy that's the type of play that this one is that we're going to be talking about the taming of the shrew and lastly, um, tragedy, um, Romeo and Juliet, okay? There's going to be death. All right, so Shakespeare's plays are written in five parts. These are called five acts, okay? Like A-C-T-S, act, okay? Um, like acting, like a play, okay? So there's five of them. This is the pattern that he always follows, okay? Within each act, there's act one, act two, Act three, act four, act five. Each act has some scenes within it, okay? So the location is going to change, okay? So the act is comprised of smaller scenes. So you'll see what this looks like as we get into reading the play. I just wanted to tell you what the format is. There's no rule about how many scenes does each act have to have, okay? So just... He does follow the formula of five acts. As for scenes, well, let's wait and see what he does for the scenes in the play. Um, so in act one, which we will start reading, not today, but the next time um, I have language with you. In act one, um, it's the exposition. Another way to put it would be the induction. Basically, it's the explanatory part. So we're going to meet the characters. Um, get a little introduction to the conflict, like what's the problem gonna be here anyways. Um, the setting, where is this located? This one's gonna be located in Italy and a few of his other plays are also located in Italy, uh, Romeo and Juliet off the top of my head. Um, and we might hear a little bit of the backstory, okay? Like what's happened previously, all right? So that's act one, um, it's explanatory. Okay, so we're going to meet some characters, learn some things about the this, this start of the story, act one, right? So that'd be a good thing to write down. Whether you say exposition or explanatory, either of those would be good. Okay, next up, act two. So what generally happens in act two is we're starting to see some conflict and the conflict is starting to ramp up it's starting to increase. So there's a bit of a, of a problem. And the problem, it's not getting better. Um, more tension, um, increasing conflict. Okay, that's act two. By the time we get to act three, this is the climax of the uh, play. So the tension reaches its peak. Okay, so we're kind of like at the top right here, where we're going to need to start come down and find a resolution to the problem. So um, it could be that we're getting to the most action filled part. Okay. Um, it's that the tension is about as tense as it's going to get. All right. So this is the high point of the story. The high point doesn't need to be to mean it's good though. It could be very stressful, but this is about as stressful as it would get if that's the case, okay? Um, so that's the climax. Another way people might word it is the turning point, 
Okay, so the tensions were ramping up, ramping up. Okay, lots of tension. And now things are going to turn and they're going to start to change. Okay, so maybe the turning point would be another good way to word this act three. Act four, because there's going to be five acts. Act four is generally the falling action. So we're going to see some events that will lead towards the resolution. Okay, so the resolution is going to be the ending where the, sometimes we might say the loose ends are tied up. Okay, so when a story is done, if the story is well written, we should generally have quite a few answers to maybe questions that were raised during the play, right? So we're starting to have events leading up to coming to that conclusion, all right? So it's not done just yet, but we're getting there. Maybe you could say um, like things are falling into place, okay? Then act five is the resolution, okay? So this is the end of the story. This is when the loose ends are tied up, okay? the ending. Sometimes it can be a happy ending, all right? Sometimes the ending may involve people dying, okay? Maybe the play is about revenge and in the end, the main character takes their vengeance, all right? And so what I'm trying to say here is that the resolution, it doesn't have to be happy and cheerful and you know, best day ever, like fairy tale ish. It's just that those ends are getting tied up. Um, okay, thinking of something I might read to my kids, the three little pigs. All right. So at the end of the story, in some of the versions, especially the older versions, the wolf climbed down the chimney and got burnt up in the fireplace. All right. So that's not exactly cheery. But the loose ends got tied up for those pigs in the sense that now they don't need to worry that anything big and bad is going to come down and eat them, okay? So it might end in death if it's a tragedy, but in Act 5, there will be the tying up of all those loose ends. Okay, so it doesn't have to be happy, but there will be an ending. All right. Um, all right, so now coming more specifically to the Taming of the Shrew. Just make sure I am recording this. Hopefully I am. <laughs> All right. So coming more specifically to the taming of the shrew. Um, so this play does raise complex questions. I was almost a little unsure if I should do it or not. But I thought, hey, let's just wait in. Okay. So this is a um, bit of a tricky play. Um, but I think that this class is going to be able to handle it. Some good deep thinkers. So we're going to wait in there, okay? So some of the questions that it can raise are um, feminist type questions, like how should a woman be treated? Um, is the husband who you're going to meet in this play, is he abusive? Is the wife in on it and she's comfortable with that relationship that they have? Um, so it's a lot of like uh, power struggles within a relationship. So things like what does an ideal relationship look like? Um, what are the roles of male and female? So you'll, you think back to this time period, this would be a time period, um, let me think. So Elizabeth I was reformed. Okay, so what had happened then was that England had been under the Catholic Church, so Catholicism. And then during Elizabeth's father's lifetime, he started having some Protestant viewpoints. So it was things like, maybe we need to get rid of the priests. Maybe we need to get rid of um, only the priests can interpret the Bible, or the Bible is only meant for people who are trained, who can read it in Latin. So it wasn't that they wanted to steer away from the Bible. It was that they wanted to... I'm going to say steer away from some of those rituals that came with being Catholic. Like back then they might have like some holy relics and say, this is like, you know, a tooth that came from John the Baptist. And maybe people would come and like maybe pray to it or, or kiss it or um, 
hope that, you know, by seeing it or by touching it, they might have some spiritual uh, benefit. Okay. So there were a lot of things that may have been affected by, um, let's say, greed, like, um, or maybe dishonesty. Let's just say there were problems within the Catholic Catholic system. So some people were having a push towards Protestantism. So less of, um, let's say the Catholic rituals, but these people were still generally people that wanted to believe and to follow the Bible. So they were trying to have, um, gender roles for male and female within a marriage and some of that will be coming out through the play as well. Okay. So some of it would be um, part of their belief system. Um, but like I did say at the beginning that even though um, the power was generally in the hands of men, they were at this transition time when their powerful, their most powerful person was a woman. It was the queen. And she was queen for a long time and she was good at what she did. Um, it was a good time for England in general. So they, they did have a strong female role model to look up to. So maybe we'd say maybe the ship was starting to turn a bit in favor of um, maybe some women being capable of doing some things. Imagine that. All right. So that's this play here. So there's definitely complex issues, okay? There's going to be some appearance versus reality. There's a younger sister that seems like she's beautiful and submissive and everybody wants to marry her. She seems like a great catch. But we're going to find out by the end of the play that that's not really who she is after all, okay? So sometimes people can look a certain way, but that's not who they really are. So we have appearance versus reality. We have what makes an ideal relationship. What's the role of women, these are types of questions that are going to be in this play. All right. Now let's get to the title. So the title is The Taming of the Shrew. So what is a shrew? So a shrew is like a small mouse-like animal that is very busy and needs to eat a whole lot. It stays very active. And it ended up being used as a negative connotation for, let's say, like a nagging, ill-tempered, grumpy wife. All right. So to call someone a shrew, it's insulting and probably you shouldn't call anyone a shrew if you want to remain friends. All right. So they're talking about taming. This is the play. We're going to tame this shrew, this little mousy, annoying, nagging animal. All right. Now in the play, we're going to find out that one of the characters is being referred to as a shrew and there's going to be a, a husband who's going to try to tame her. Okay, so we'll see how that works out. Um, and all right, so that's it for today. Um, please excuse my low quality video. I'm going to try to make a few of these for you while you're away, Tristan. So um, hopefully we'll get better with time. So this is like background to the story. And next time we will start in act one. Okay, so it would be worth um, listening to this again if you didn't catch it the first time and writing down the different things about like the five acts, what are they about? Maybe even about Shakespeare's three different types of plays that he wrote. Um, Cause this background is what's going to help you to understand later on. Okay. Uh, take care. Thanks for listening. Bye.